Good morning. Hey, it's good to see you here this morning in the building and online. We're glad that you've joined us. I would like to read to you a little single-handedly flip to Romans 5. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. I've been spending quite a bit of time thinking about this over Easter and talking with our family and the kids and and uh, it, it's amazing to me what God has done. So why don't you guys join me as we sing about it. Just one word You come the storm that surrounds me
we are singing that out to you today. Holy, holy, holy. And we love you, Lord. Amen. You can have a seat. Morning, everyone. Good to see you here. Hey, Mitch, good to see you. You know what? I want to say a few things before I say something, and uh, I just want to bring you up to speed on two or three issues. Um, Number one, it would be if you could pray for our staff. We've had a lot of COVID, and there still is a lot of COVID, and so we're short-staffed, and some are away, and it's... um, it, we're a little hard to get everything done right now, and we're in the middle of a number of planning funerals and things like that. So we just, we'd appreciate your prayer. Just pray they'd get back to health and, and uh, get back to work. Um, that would be really, really helpful to all of us. Uh, second thing is, last week was a good weekend. 
And uh, some of you made commitments to the Lord, and that was a really good thing. Uh, Sunday night, a whole family responded uh, to the Lord, and so that was exciting. And I just, I've had some questions this week about how we follow that up, and, and I want to just bring before your attention three opportunities that would really help you grow. Uh, one is Alpha. We talk a lot about Alpha. That's Christianity 101. And if, if you just made a new commitment to the Lord, Alpha would be a great place to engage in. Uh, it's every Tuesday night, starting at 6.30. We have dinner. You just come. I mean, it doesn't matter if you only come once or twice, or whatever, just come. Have dinner. We listen to a presentation by a man named Nicky Gumbel on some basics of Christianity. And then we sit around tables and any question goes. And you're with people that, um, you know, you, you can be safe with. And if you have a friend that needs to know Jesus or is just trying to get a fish around a lure, then bring them. They'd be welcome there. Then another course that we do starting April 27th is Foundations. It's an eight-week course designed by Pastor Denise for Christians that want to go deeper. If you want to go deeper in your faith and get a bit more understanding, this is a tremendous course. She's done a great job on it, and you would be welcome to come and be a part of that. Third thing I'll just mention for women, we have a rooted Bible conference coming up. Uh, eight, or May, rather, the um, 13th to 14th. And this conference is uh, to help women engage with Scripture, to get to know God better, to get to know each other better. And it, it's going to be a tremendous conference. And if you, if you um, are free and, and would like to come, that's coming up May 13th to 14th. All this stuff you can find on our website or there's information out in the foyer on that. Then one other thing I should tell you, uh, starting next week, uh, May 1st, through the month of May, five Sundays, we're going to go through a, a short series, five-week series, called The Joyful Life on the book of Philippians. It's going to be a great, a great time. And uh, I'm going to kick it off and introduce you to the book, and then, and then we'll have what I call our dream team come up, and Denise and Jordan and Julie, and, and we're going to bring someone else up at the end of it. I'm going to tell you that uh, in a couple of weeks, but um, it's going to be a great series. And it's... Um, Philippians is a book that can change your life. It really can. It goes together with Lamentations, actually, if you would believe it. Um, you know, we can lament and grieve and at the same time have deep joy. Uh, we sorrow, but not like those without hope. And, Lament and Philippians will be a great little study. What we're asking you to do, here's an ask, is that every week we would read through the book. So I'd like to, you to read through the book to get ready for next week. It's only four chapters long. Imagine if, if for five weeks, a whole church every week read the book of Philippians. It, it would be transformative. And so I'm just going to encourage you to do that as we go through this little study. Uh, we did it once before in 2007, but this is vastly new and improved. Uh, that was like 17 years ago, and I had no idea what I was talking about. But these people, they have lots of ideas, and it's going to be really, really good. So that's what's coming down in May for, for five weeks. So today, what are we going to do? I want to take you back to the Sunday evening of Easter Sunday, and I want to talk to you about a story that Luke writes up about Sunday evening of Easter Sunday. Luke, by the way, is just a master storyteller. If you read Luke, you'll be riveted by his stories. I mean, he tells the story of the, the uh, prodigal son, and it's a brilliant, one of the best stories ever told. That Rem, so grab Rembrandt that one of his great paintings is the return of the prodigal. I mean, this is a story you'll never forget. And then, and then Luke will write up this story that we're going to read here. And if the prodigal son is one of the best stories ever told, this is one of the best sketches that anybody ever penned that we'll read now. now Luke is just a brilliant storyteller. And so I, I want to read it to you. And I'm going to read the postscript to you as well because it's actually part of the story and plays into it. So it's in, in Luke chapter 24, and um, you're all up to speed looking at the screen. I'm bumbling and fumbling trying to find it up here. So here it is. Let me read it. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles. For Canadians, that's 11 kilometers. Um, the New Canadian Translation will have that. About, about seven miles or 11 kilometers from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, 
Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. I suspect he had a twinkle in his eye. What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they didn't see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about all this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. So he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It's I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that's written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Just a great story. Takes place on Easter Sunday evening. Who were these guys, or couple? Cleopas is one that's named. Uh, it's guesswork about the other one. Uh, what we do know about both of them is they were insiders. They were insiders. They, were, they had been in the room with the disciples when Mary and the others came from the tomb and said the tomb's empty. It's clear they were insiders. They had seen Jesus, been with them, part of the larger group of disciples. That much is clear. I would guess, and I think it's a good guess, although a lot of the learned people don't agree with me. But I think the other one would be Mrs. Cleopas, wouldn't you? I mean, after all, they went to the same house. They lived in the same place. If you come to my house, if I invite you for dinner, not all at once, but if I did, I wouldn't make dinner. Because if I did, you wouldn't come back. Somebody made dinner at that house. My guess is... We're talking about a husband and wife, disciples, insiders, on a road from Jerusalem to Emmaus, Easter Sunday evening. So just as we follow the story, here's the question that I want to just be behind the whole story. It would be this question. Has the resurrection, let me state it again, has the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ changed your life? Has the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ actually changed your life? For a lot of Christians, the resurrection is a past event, not a present reality. So my question is, is the resurrection of Jesus a present reality 
or just somehow a past event to you? That's a, that's a question that I think is demanded by the story that we read as we walk through it. And I, I just want to walk through it with you and keep that question in mind. Has the resurrection of Jesus Christ really, really changed my life? Well, you got these two disciples. They're, um, they're on the road to Emmaus, 11 kilometers. They start out. Um, they, they probably don't get too far out of Jerusalem, and a stranger comes up behind and joins them. And it's quite clear that they are not wanting his company. They don't engage him. He has to engage them. In fact, their response is rather rude. There are two people that are just in trouble. They're in trouble. But it's Jesus, and they don't recognize him, which raises this question. Why do you think Jesus spent 40 days before he went back to heaven appearing to his disciples? Why do you think he appeared to them and to Peter and to the whole lot? One of the reasons would have to be for therapy, for therapy. They were all in trouble, every one of them, either locked behind closed doors in fear and trembling or overcome by guilt and failure and sin like Peter. He couldn't get over the train wreck he'd had when he denied Jesus three times. He was in trouble. These people were in trouble. These people were discouraged, dismayed, depressed, bewildered, confused. They, um, they were in real trouble. And one of the reasons Jesus came back was for therapy, to put them back on their feet, to put them back on their feet. That's what he did with Peter, wasn't it? Peter, you remember Peter, he, he, he meets Peter, and it's by the lake after Jesus has been raised from the dead. And, and, and Peter, he, he, hasn't been, he, hasn't tried to, he hasn't figured out, you know, how he would ever process what he just did. And then he's face-to-face with the person he denied. And Jesus takes him aside after breakfast by, by a little fire and asks him three times, Peter, do you love me? To mirror the three times that Peter denied Jesus. And he restores Peter. And he not only forgives him, but he gives him a brand new past. When Peter denied Jesus, it was over a charcoal fire. He would never be able to go camping again without remembering he denied Jesus. But Jesus restores him over a charcoal charcoal fire. He'll never see that fire again the same way. He, He put him back on his feet. That's what he's doing here. He's going to put these disciples back on their feet because they're in trouble. And they're actually a perfect picture of the way we sometimes are, even post-resurrection, overcome by sin or failure, guilt, discouraged, depressed, dismayed, confused, bewildered. I mean, the whole thing. And one of the great ministries of the risen Jesus is putting, putting his people back on their feet. It's actually quite an ironic tale. Living disciples... We're talking about a dead Jesus, and a living Jesus is talking to lifeless disciples on this road. Um, Some of us can't get over our failure, can't get over our guilt, can't get over what we've done. Some of us are like the disciples. You notice they said to Jesus, we had hoped. In other words, all their hopes had been dashed, destroyed. It's like Jesus had set them up and then dashed their hopes. If you haven't experienced that, you will in your Christian life. You will. There's times when it feels like he, he takes us, sets us up, and then dashes our hopes. Maybe it's marriage. You prayed for a spouse, and God gave you somebody, and it felt just right, and you know, went along well for a little while, and then, and then the whole thing blew apart, and it's like he, just, he destroyed us. Or maybe it's kids. You know, you you had children and you prayed for them in their mother's womb and you dedicated them to the Lord like there's a dedication going on today in the the chapel and and, um, you brought them up in the way of the Lord. Then they made their own decisions and went their own way and all your hopes have been dashed. And it's, it's almost like the Lord destroyed them. It's like, Lord, we did what you asked us to do and now look at this train wreck. Or you prayed for direction and it seemed like God opened a door over here for a job and you took it and yet, and it was terrible, and it just went from bad to worse. And if you've never been where they are, you will be. And, 
And their condition is so much like ours. And so it's worth asking this question, why were they in trouble? Why, how did they get in this condition? I think two reasons. One is this. They were too upset to think straight about matters of fact. They were too upset to think straight about matters of fact. It's, it's crazy. They were telling the good news as though it was bad news. They were telling the good news as though it was bad news. Their problem was they'd forgotten what he'd actually said to them. He actually said to them, on the third day, I'm going to rise from the dead. Went right over their heads. Listen to this in Luke 18. While he's still with them, he says this. He took the 12 aside, and he told them, listen to what he told them. We're going to go up to Jerusalem, and everything that's written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They'll mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him, and on the third day, he'll rise again. Is that cl not clear? They're going to kill him, and on the third day, he's going to rise again. They totally forgot. That's why I said to you a few weeks ago, the root of most of our problems in the Christian life is we just forget. We don't remember the things that Jesus has told us, the things he's sown into our hearts. We so easily forget, and so we get into a lot of trouble. The other reason they were in trouble is they were ignorant of their Bibles. They were just plain ignorant of their Bibles. If they had known the scriptures, which they had and should have known, they wouldn't be in this kind of trouble. In fact, he doesn't rebuke them. It's interesting to me. He doesn't rebuke them for disbelieving the evidence of the resurrection, the grave cloths, the empty tomb. doesn't rebuke them for that. He doesn't rebuke them for not believing the witnesses. He doesn't even rebuke them for not recognizing them. Why does he rebuke them? He rebukes them for not knowing and believing the scriptures. That's why he rebukes them. They should have known these things, but they didn't. In fact, they, they used the word redeem, um, but didn't know what the Bible taught about redemption. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel, and they had no idea what the Bible taught about that. Somehow they'd missed Isaiah 53 that talked about the servant of God that was going to come and the sin of the world put on him and he, he was going to pay the penalty and, and die. And, and, then, and then after that, he'd be raised to life and the impact would be global. Somehow they missed that whole thing. How did they miss that? They, they missed it because they never took it seriously. Um, and, and again, I'll come back to something I said last week. Sight, physical sight, seeing the empty tomb, seeing Jesus is viewed as inferior to faith based on the written word of God. That's a really, really important point. Physical sight is, is viewed as inferior to faith that's based not on physical sight, but the written word of God. As with Mary, so with these disciples, he points them back to the written word of God and said it's all there. Now, why... Why would I say that? Because the word of God is eternal, established in the heavens. It's a living word from a God that cannot lie, and you can take it and build your whole life on it. And it will not, and he will not let you down. His word will never fail. Um, it, it, powerful when you think about the fact that we all sit with Bibles on our phones or in our, in our hands, and how little we pay attention to them. And I wonder what he'd say to us today. He said to them, how foolish you are and slow of heart to not believe what the scriptures teach. Um, it's very interesting because we get shaken. We go through COVID, we get shaken. We get fearful, we get anxious. You know, you get these big rifts that appear in the land. And all of it goes back to the fact we don't know the word of God. We have no idea. The Word of God said, don't fear, I'm with you. Don't be dismayed, I'm your God. I'm going to strengthen you and help you. And we get more of our information, even as Christians, from some blog or some doctor than we do from the written Word of God that will tell us from beginning to end that God is sovereign, in charge, knows what he's doing. He's going to finish the work he's begun in my life, and I can trust him with all of my heart. Um, it's, it's not rocket science what we're into. But the enemy will do anything and everything to distract us from the Word of God which is the sure foundation for the times in which we live. And I know, and I've said this before, and I believe with all my heart, someone said, what's the, what's the greatest challenge you face at Crossroads? Or what's the greatest challenge the church faces? You know what it is? It is to get our people to read the Word of God. 
and actually believe it. It doesn't matter if we have 10,000 strategies on how to reach Red Deer for Christ. If we don't know the Word of God, we'll have nothing to say to them, and we'll have no desire to go. That's the greatest challenge we face. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, I know that because I, 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 know, I know the people of Crossroads. And I, we, we did a survey here not that long ago. And you know what one of the questions on the survey was? How many times do you read the Word of God a week? What do you think one of the common responses was? Once in seven days. And I thought to myself, once in seven days? What? If you don't read it six days, why would you read it on the seventh? Like, it doesn't make sense to me. Then I thought, oh, then a light bulb came on. I think I was in a coffee shop. A light bulb came on. And the light bulb moment was this. Oh, we read it when it's on the screen. That's the, but that will never keep you when life hits. They were in trouble because they didn't know the scriptures. You know, I said this to a group of denominational leaders that I was talking to this week about their churches. I said, you know, um, you know, one of the one of the issues that we're all facing right now is um, is this whole issue of how do we manage and get through COVID. And I said the thing that struck me was a, a line from Jeremiah where Jeremiah says, God says to Jeremiah, "If you can't even run with men on foot, what are you going to do when I ask you to run with horses? If we can't handle COVID," without having our faith shaken and our body divided, what would we ever do if there was real persecution? If it really hit, what would we do? We'd disintegrate. It comes back to reading, believing, obeying the Word of God. That's the solid foundation, and that's where they were in trouble. And he rebuked them for it, actually, and I wonder if he wouldn't rebuke us for the same thing. Well, um, so my question, has the resurrection really changed us? Let me ask you this question. Has Jesus Christ put you back on your feet? Do you know that the guilt and failure and sin in, in your past has been paid for by Jesus Christ at the cross? And has he assured you of that? Listen, I want to I belabor this point for a moment. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, what do you do when somebody you love comes to you and says, I'm sorry, I was wrong, and I hurt you? You forgive them, and you affirm them, or you should. The Lord Jesus is exactly the same. When you confess your sin, wait for him to talk to you. Wait for him to reassure you that your sins are forgiven. Wait for him to lift up your head, which is so hard to get back up. He will do that. He's real. He's real. And he's really risen. And he really hears and he really cares. And that word of assurance from him will put you back up on your feet. The way that the Lord Jesus um, provides therapy for every one of his disciples that were in trouble is through the written word of God. Not through some word that he grabbed out of the air. Through the written word of God. He applied therapy to them, and he applied it in the proper way to them, and they got back on their feet. That's the way he'll do it to you, too. That's why it's so critical to sit in his presence and listen to his word, because it's the main way that he talks to you. It's the main way he puts you back on your feet. Um, So has has the resurrection really changed? Has the resurrection given you a new passion for the word of God, where he reveals himself to us? You know, I did some of them. I wondered about the math on this thing, and 11 kilometers. Again, it's a bit of guesswork, but I'm thinking that they hadn't got too far on the road to Emmaus, and this stranger joins them. And if they're going about two miles an hour, don't know what that is in kilometers, um, but if they're going about that, they're not going to go fast with their heavy-hearted like they are. In fact, at one point, they stop. It it, it means that they they would have had about two or three hours of Jesus teaching them from the scriptures, Genesis right through. Isn't that amazing? Wouldn't you love to have been there? We're talking about an Old Testament survey course where Jesus takes you from the beginning of the Bible right through and tells you how it all fits together and all points to him. And and they didn't even know this till afterwards, but they get to their home and their hearts are burning within them. Somehow they went from burdened hearts to burning hearts and they didn't even know how. And then I remembered how that happens. You ever been 
sitting under the ministry of the Word of God. And at some point, you have no idea how, your heart starts burning within you. I remember a man named Alan Redpath from Britain. He came to Vancouver. And I mean, I, mean, I, I still do. If I wasn't here, I would go anywhere to hear the Word of God. I mean, I, I, worship and all that's great. I need the Word of God. And, and I, when he came to town, I did, I'm going to hear Alan Redpath. And as he opened the word of God and began to teach us, my heart was burning within me because I found myself in the presence of the living Jesus. Um, it's a wonderful thing when that happens, and it happened to them. And so they're, they're get, they get to, to where they live, and Jesus makes as if he's going to go on. And they say, hey, hey, time out. No, come and spend the night with us. I think a couple of reasons. One is it's dangerous out there in Palestine at night on those roads. Still is, was then, still is today. There's wild animals, there's criminals, there's like, you can't go on in the dark, you better stay with us. But also, I, they were so intrigued with what he was teaching them, they wanted to hear more, and so they, they took him in and they had a meal, and then the, the whole text slows down. It's beautiful. When he was at the table with them, tell you, Luke's gonna just slow this thing right down. He took bread, then he gave thanks, then he broke it, then he began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open, and he recognized them, and they recognized him. Isn't that cool? A lot of people say they had a communion. It was communion, and I um, mean, you know, I don't think that's what it was at all. I think it was an ordinary meal in an ordinary house. Every text in the New Testament, by the way, that talks about communion always includes wine, not just bread. Some of the terminology is the same, but there's, the table became the place of the presence. The table became the place of the presence. I wonder what it would be like if we expected that Jesus would show up at our dinner tables, that we would fellowship with him. Isn't that why we pray? Lord, thank you for this food, and we welcome your presence at this table. What if we, what if we got back to something we kind of, well, we got, we got stuck with this whole idea of hospitality with COVID, but maybe we can get back on track. What if when we brought people in, we actually expected that when we sat together over food, Jesus might show up and warm their hearts. In Luke, another way of looking at Luke, um, I, I thought of a series of sermons sometime on Luke, but it won't happen, called The Hospitality of God. The Hospitality of God. Because Luke is all about dinner parties. He's all about dinner parties. And Jesus showing up at dinner parties. And it, it happens here. And I, I long for that to happen in my home. And I wonder if the resurrection has changed us to the point where we actually expect him to show up when we welcome his presence and the giving of thanks for the food that's in front of us. And then, as soon as they recognize him, he disappears. They recognize him and he disappeared from their sight. And then they do a crazy thing. They go right back on the road. They get up and return at once. To, to, they told Jesus not to do that. Now they do that. Why? They were completely changed. They'd seen Jesus. There was a confidence and a courage that you couldn't knock out of them. They went all the way back in the night, traveled through the night to Jerusalem. What would it be like if we really believed that he was real, that he was raised from the dead, that he was going to work with us tomorrow morning? or going to school with us? What if we really believed that? What would change? That's how the resurrection changed them. They weren't afraid of anything because they knew he was with them. They weren't afraid anymore. It's, it's a radical transformation that takes place here. And so has the resurrection changed you to that extent that you actually believe he'll be with you tomorrow and whatever you're facing, he's adequate. He's adequate. Whatever you face, he's adequate. 1147, I got time. Let's remember a story, a true story I read about some people in South Africa, friends from South Africa here, and, and they, um, they ordered a Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow from Britain, had it shipped down, brand new Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow. And as they do, what you do with a new car, they went through the manual and they, you know, they, they looked at everything. And the, the only thing that wasn't in the manual was the horsepower of this thing. 
And if you're going to spend that kind of money, you should know how much horsepower your Rolls Royce Silver Shadow brand new has. They couldn't, so they, they emailed London and said, um, you know, they, they gave the car and the serial number, and please, please email exact horsepower. A day later, they got an email, and it was one word, adequate, <laughs> adequate. You know what the Lord would say to you? You need my help tomorrow. You're in way over your head. He'd say, I'm adequate. I'm adequate. You got health issues. You got financial issues. You're going to make big adequate. What difference would it make if he was real? And you actually believed that he was present with you. You'd pray all the time. You'd say, Lord, I have this deal going on at work. Or, Lord, I need to make a decision. Or, or thank you, Jesus. Or it's just like, because he'd be right there. That's, I wonder if for us often the resurrection isn't just a past historical event that we celebrate on Easter Sunday, but maybe not a present reality today. This is the day we need them. Well, that's that. I love the little postscript. Do you mind if I take 10 more minutes and just tell you about the postscript? I just need three people to say yes. That's, that's a quorum. We got it. I know it. We're done. We're good. Um, and if I need another 10, I'll come back to you, but just hang on. So this little postscript is beautiful. While they're, they get back and they're telling all these guys, yeah, he really is alive. And then it says, Jesus stood among them. He just showed up. He just showed up. And I, as I read that, I thought, here's how the resurrection can change our life. Yeah, he can, he can put us back on our feet. He can give us new confidence and courage. When I read this little postscript, the resurrection changes, or ought to change, the way we relate to other people. It ought to change the way we relate to other people. Think about that. What are the first four words he says when he walks in the room? Peace be with you. Does that not blow your mind? These guys are crazy. These guys have betrayed him. These people have let him down all over the place. And he doesn't come in and say, he doesn't come in and say, hey, what are you all doing locked behind closed doors? He doesn't come in and say, hey, why did you let me down? He doesn't come in and say, why did you disappear when I really needed you? What were you thinking? No, he just comes in and says, peace be with you. Now, that, that stopped me in my tracks. It reminded me of John 21 where he walks onto the beach, a bunch of other disciples and Peter, and they were, they were in a bad way. He could have nailed them. And you know what he said? First word out of the mouth, friends, friends. Let me tell you what God is like. He's like Jesus. You think because you failed him and you've sinned so bad that he could never forgive you again because you've done it the 400th time? You think that he doesn't have any time for you? Because of what he did on Good Friday, he can walk into your room and the first words out of his mouth will be, peace be to you. Pay that debt? I paid that debt. Pay it finished. Far as east is from the west. Return to me with all of your heart. That's what he would say. Peace be to you. His words were warm, connecting, calm, belonging. His words set the tone for the conversation. His words set the tone for the conversation. What would happen if the first thing we did, we met somebody, was set the tone by setting the table that way? Hey, friend, peace. You know, I, I'm glad you don't know me Monday to Saturday. I'm not that nice a person. It takes me a while to get nice for Sunday, but um, you should see me driving. It's terrible. And what I, what I say to people in the closed confines of my car that don't drive properly, um, when I'm in a drive through and it's not moving fast enough, I have a whole speech ready when I get up there and how they could do this better. And I wonder 
often, Lord, help me set the tone of the conversation much better. You got a lot of work to do with me, Lord. I, Ginny was away one Sunday a few years ago, and, um, you know, Sundays, I just got to tell you this. I'll just be honest with you, and you can fire me. I, I'm not much used to you on Sunday afternoons. If you need me, call Stu or Ken or somebody. Don't call me. You know, when you've stood up here and talked for two times, you, you feel like a wreck. You feel like, man, I've just, Lord, can you just, can you just give me one more chance to redeem myself? You all often feel like that, you know? And so I just want to hide. Ginny wasn't there to debrief with, so I, I found one of my, a place I often go to for lunch here when I'm on my own, and, and a place I can hide, and I was having lunch, and never seen the waitress before, and she, she wasn't very good. And I wasn't very good. It was kind of like a perfect storm. And by the time I was ready to leave, I had a speech, and there was no tip, nothing, zero. And she came back with the bill, and she put the bill on the table, and she said, there you go, Pastor Dan, see you in church tonight. Oh. Her tip went from zero to the best one she ever had. It just it was unbelievable. I thought, Lord, help me lead like you do. Help me set the tone of the conversation. Peace be with you. He's brilliant the way he does that. He, he just draws them right in. What if we related to people that? That's one way that resurrection could change us. And then I, I chose another word, presence. Just presence. I mean, when you read the story, he's so present to them. He's so present to them. He eats with them. He shows them his hands and feet. He says, touch me, see, feel me, it's really me. He, he reads their hearts. Why are you troubled and why do you doubt? He, he was all there, fully present, engaged, whatever you want to say. Maybe you've had moments like that with Jesus too, where it just feels all of a sudden he's just, he's so present. He's listening to everything you say and he's responding to it. And it's amazing. We're meant to take that out and live it out in our relationships. We're, we're called to be present to the people we live with, the people we work with, the people we relate to, the people we see. How many times in my marriage have I heard the words, you haven't listened to a word I said. I know you haven't heard that, but I have many times. And it's usually just when she said something, I missed the whole thing, and I ask her a question about it. You haven't heard a word I said. I'm not present. Jesus was present. Present to everybody. You know, I, I, when I went through the Lord's Prayer, I, I read a lot of books around the Lord's Prayer to try and, and get into it and understand it and finished the whole series. And one of my best friends in England, Alan Palmer, he, after the series was over, he said, hey, you should get this book on the Lord's Prayer. It's really good. I said, well, thank you. I needed it a few weeks ago, Alan. But I bought it anyway. And it's called Living the, Living the Lord's Prayer. It's by Father Albert Haas. And he's a Catholic writer, a great writer. And, and I'm learning lots from it. Um, but he has this great story in it. And do you mind when I tell you these things? I, I just read them. And I thought, you know, maybe if, if they help you, well, if they don't, then just whatever. Um, Albert Haas, Catholic priest, on his way to Good Friday Mass. He said, I, on, the, on that Friday, so many years ago, Good Friday, I finished shopping at a sporting goods store in downtown Chicago. Since, since it was getting near one o'clock, the time the Good Friday service was to begin, I'd have to walk fast to get to the church on time. As I left the store and started down the street, a beggar approached me for a handout. Hey, mister, how about some change for food I haven't eaten in two days? Albert says I could tell by the alcohol in his breath that he was telling me a half-truth. I pretended not to notice him and quickly stepped up my pace. After all, I was the priest and I had to get to church on time. But after I'd walked about 30 yards, something told me to turn around. I looked over my shoulder and froze in my tracks. There was Jesus standing where the beggar had been. And though the street was crowded and I was 30 yards away, I heard the Lord say to me, Albert, you couldn't give me some change, not even on a good Friday? He said, on that good Friday so many years ago, I encountered God in the flesh and I failed the test wasn't present. How many times do we all fail that test? Jesus was 
He was so present. And he came on with peace. But there's another word, and I just I, I chose another P to alliterate it for you. It's the word power. It actually occurs in the text. Power. You're going to be my witnesses, Jesus says. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. Stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. That's the Holy Spirit. We relate not only to each other, to our families, but we relate to the world outside that still has to know Jesus Christ. That's why our vision as a church is to reach outside of these four walls. But you know what? It takes power to do that, the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't just share with your neighbor. I mean, we're, we're scared to death half the time. But it's the, it, Jesus said, you're going to be my witnesses, but I'm going to give you power to do that. So the resurrection changes us in this sense that the, God says that in Ephesians chapter 1, the incomparably great power of his spirit is available to us. And then Ephesians 1 says, that power is like the, the, the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted when he raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand far above everything. That power is your power in Red Deer in Central Alberta. Same power. That's awesome. There are three New Testament writers that talk about the Holy Spirit the most. Do you know who they are? They are Luke, John, and Paul. John talks about the Holy Spirit as a continuation of the ministry of Jesus. So Jesus says, you know, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send someone just like me, and he'll do what I've been doing. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. He'll remind you. He'll rebuke you when you need it. He'll comfort you. But he's going to t continue my work. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit that John highlights. Paul, on the other hand, when he talks about the Holy Spirit, talks about the life of Jesus in us. So the Holy Spirit is the one that's going to create fruit, the fruit of the, the character of Jesus in you. He's going to do that in you. And not only that, Paul says, but he's given you spiritual gifts. And those gifts are for the building up of the body. And every Christian has a spiritual gift from the Holy Spirit and is required to use them and grow them and develop them. Paul will write about that. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 13, well, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 are the, the key ones there. And Paul will talk about it in Romans 12 as well. Ephesians 4 is another place where he talks about gifts of the Spirit. Luke, on the other hand, when he talks about the Holy Spirit, he's different. Luke talks about the power of the Holy Spirit for mission, for mission. He, he says the Spirit is going to push you out of the building so that you'll be witnesses. That's what Luke will say. The, the, the most uncomfortable ministry of the Holy Spirit, the one the church has always unsettled the church in its history right down to today is Luke's emphasis on mission. Because it's fun to sit around sometimes and talk about gifts. And it's a good thing. And um, it's nice to know that he's going to lead me and guide me like John says. But if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, we would never go to the places that we ought to go, Ever. The gospel would never have got out of Jerusalem if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit. If it's not for the Holy Spirit, the gospel won't get across your street. He's going to push you in places where you're not comfortable. Some of you is going to push to go on a missions trip or to the ends of the earth, but that's what the Holy Spirit does. And uh, what Luke says here is, that's how the resurrection changes you. The Spirit will push you into uncomfortable zones to be a witness for Jesus Christ. So let me come back to the question I started with. Has the resurrection of Jesus actually changed your life? Is it a present reality or just a past historical event? Have you found the Lord ministering to you through his word, putting you back on your feet when you need it? Are you sure of his personal presence in your life? Are you sure tomorrow morning that his presence will go with you wherever you're going. Has the resurrection of Jesus actually changed the way you relate to the people in your life? Do you find power for mission? Do you put people on your hearts to pray for and open doors for you to talk to? The Bible says that Jesus Christ 
He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the living, present Lord of his church, of his people. And his kingdom will come, and his will will be done. And our job is to keep in step with him. Let's stand together and pray. Father in heaven, thank you again for your words. And Father, we often uh, struggle with a lot of this stuff. I know I do. And I pray you'd keep reminding us that the Lord Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that your spirit is the spirit of power. Same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. So Father, I pray that today, wherever we need your ministry, that you would allow your son to minister to our hearts, to put us back on our feet. I pray, Father, that you would remind us of your presence. I pray that when we're dealing with people, even today, that we learn from the Lord about how to approach them with a warm, open heart. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
You know, on, on behalf of um, on behalf of the Lord Jesus, thank you for coming. You have no idea how much it means to his heart that you showed up today. Some of you were not feeling like coming, and, but you came. Some of you drove a long way to get here. Some of you had all sorts of stuff to deal with, but you showed up, and it means so much to him, so much to him. It warms his heart as he moves amongst us when people worship him, when we come under his word, when we go out to serve him. Like, of all the things that you could be doing on a Sunday morning, you showed up, and you need to know he's thrilled. He's thrilled. And I just want to pray as we leave. You know, up here after, as we always do, we'll have people that'll pray with you. Maybe you need to get back on your feet. They'll, they'll help you talk to the Lord and he'll put you back on your feet. We're gonna pray, we're gonna worship in here, we're gonna fellowship out there like you don't have to run off. But I um, just wanna pray for you as you go today. Father, I pray for all these people here today. Lord, they came because you mean something to them. Father, they came because they wanna say thank you. They came because they want to worship you. They came because, again, they, they need to hear your powerful word. And, Father, they came because they want to get new strength to go out and serve you this week. And I pray you would bless them and keep them for that. Father, there's people here today that they're bewildered about life. And I, I pray that you would assure them of your presence today, that you would go with them. Father, there's people facing health issues. I pray you'd let them know that, that you work everything together for good to those that love you and that in the end, not a hair of our head will perish because we put our trust in the one who's called the resurrection and the life. Father, they may need new strength. I pray you'd renew them. Father, you're still the healer. We pray you'd stretch down and you'd heal people. Father, you're still a restorer. Would you restore people? You're still the one. You're still the one that we love. And I pray you'd receive that gratitude and love of our hearts today. And Father, I pray for all these people that today you'd make your face shine upon them and be gracious to them. That you'd turn toward them with those four words, peace, peace be unto you. So Father, it's with the, our faith in your son, Jesus, trusting in the leadership of the Holy Spirit this week, that we go out to serve you and to live for you alone. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Storms move forward.